the Lord might have given him wings. There was something wrong with him. Our poor things shouldering this inevitable. America's hell and everything after this hour's confession. The officer's eponymous blue, their shields and silences and walls drown the living. If prison is where black men go to become Lazarus or to become Jonas, this kid must already have wings. And his mother is the one they don't give a name. Tonight's speaker is someone who will share his story of meeting with incredible adversity across a variety of life experiences. Uh, persevering and then delivering a measure of triumph against what seem like all odds. Uh, this story will speak for itself, so I will uh, leave it to our speaker to, um, to tell it. Um, it. It is, however, clear that we as individuals in our society need to hear stories told more and more so we can reach a heightened awareness of our human condition, um, reach true understanding, and embrace the call to action that they can generate. I will start by saying um, this is a great space, and I wrote, I wrote this book here in Boston, I wrote it in Cambridge at Harvard. I actually wrote it all over the city. I'm one of those writers who's constantly trying to find somewhere to work. So I used to write in art libraries, in cafes, in my car. And um, so it's great to come back and read the book in a place where it was birthed. And it's funny, this library is interesting because I used to walk past it all the time and, and not absolutely notice it, which, um, which is troubling for me because I realize I'm not as smart as anyone in this room who was able to find a library and come when I wasn't. A few things I will say, I'll just read for a minute and then I'll say some things as I read. For the city that nearly broke me. A woman tattoos Malik's name above her breast and talks about the conspiracy to destroy blacks. This is all a fancy way to say that someone kirked out, empty five or six or seven shots into a still warm body. No indictment follows Malik's death, follows smoke running from a fired pistol, an old quarrel, crimson against concrete and the officer's gun still smoking. Someone says that people need to stand up, that the system's a glass house falling on only a few heads. This and the stop snitching ass out of conundrum and damn all that blood. All those closed eyes imagining Malik's killer forever called to a series of cells. And you almost believe them. You do. Except the cognac in your hand is an old habit. A toast to friends buried before the daybreak of their old age. You know the truth of the talking, of the quarrels, and how history lets the blame go blameless for the blood that flows black in the street. You imagine there's a riot going on and someone is tossing a trash can through Sal's window calling that revolution. While behind us, cell doors keep clanking closed and Malik's class casket door clanks closed and the bodies that roll off the block and into the prisons and into the ground keep rolling. And no one will admit that this is the way America strangles itself. I keep looking in the audience because there's people that I know who I think are coming, and I'm not sure if I can see them. Um, so I'm troubled because I'm looking for them and I don't see them. Um, all right. For the city that nearly broke me. So the book has a bunch of poems with the same title, For the City That Nearly Broke Me. And um, these readings are always interesting because you get an opportunity to talk about the poems and pretend that you intended to do things that you didn't actually intend to do. And also you get to pretend that people in the audience care <laughs> when they might not care at all. But if there are any writers in the audience or people who are remotely interested in the writing process and specifically in my process of writing this book, the one thing I'll say is I wrote all of these poems and the thing is you write a poem, you figure, okay, it's not finished and you put it to the side and you start writing another poem. And I've written three of these poems that didn't have titles at all. And then I just started calling them for the city that nearly broke me. And I thought they were different poems, but what came to, I thought they were one poem, but I realized that they were my attempt to say one thing and not being able to say it effectively or the way I wanted to. And so I would say it again and again. And for me, it's, um, 
Has anybody seen the movie Fences? So if you haven't seen the movie Fences, oh, Gretchen, hey. All right, so that's what I was talking about, just like so it's not a secret. But um, so it's a scene in the movie Fences where, where Troy is trying to explain to his wife, so just the broad outline of the movie, Troy and, um, and Rose are married, and Troy has been cheating on Rose, and he's gotten this woman pregnant, and um, he has to tell Rose. And so Rose is like, wait, I've been here for 17 years. What is going on? And Troy is trying to explain it to her, and he says something about baseball. And Rose says, this, this is not about baseball. Like, you're not explaining it to me. And Troy says, it is about baseball. And I had an argument with somebody about the book. Not an argument, but I read this poem, and it was, I'm going to read it in a minute. And the guy says, uh, well, well, why is crack in this poem? Like, like crack doesn't seem to belong in, in this particular poem. And I was explaining to him that, um, that sometimes you are overwhelmed by something. And for this book, I was overwhelmed by the conversations I had around the war on drugs. I was overwhelmed by um, the ramifications of criminal justice policies in my own life and the life of my students. And so what happened is it was always there and it became my explanation for everything else that I wanted to say. And what, what Troy was trying to say to Rose, I think, was that you think baseball doesn't explain it, but like everything I am is explained by the tragedy of my baseball career. Everything I am, both my promise and my failure, is explained by the tragedy of my baseball career. Um, I hope that that comes off better as I explain it to you than it did with Rose, because uh, she didn't get in until after he died. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna, read the, I'm gonna read the poem that led to that conversation. At the end of life, a secret. Everything measured. A man twists the tuft of your hair out for no reason other than you are naked before him. And he is bored with nakedness. Moments ago, he was weighing your gallbladder and then he was staring at the empty space where your lungs were. Even dead, we still insist you are an organ donor as if something other than taxes outlasts death. Your feet are regular feet, two of them, and there is no mark to suggest you were an expert mathematician, nothing that suggests that a woman loves you when you died. From the time your body was carted before him to the time your dead body is being sent to the coffin, every single pound is accounted for, except 22 grams. The man is a praying man and has figured what it means. He says, this is the soul finally after the breath is gone. The soul, less than $4,000 worth of crack, 22 grams, all that moves you through this world. For the city that nearly broke me. Nothing here can be considered prayer. Not clasped hands, not heads bowed in abeyance, not the scream that ratchet against the white walls of this school. The students lean in, swallowed by the noise they invent, staring as two bodies prance around each other like they are shadows of God's hands sparring with the world. And someone will die, though not here, not this day, in this hall where trauma clashes and breaks against silence. The inevitable, the world reduced to fists and the heads weaving and fuck it all as the mob of students and teachers watch and wonder what we hunger for in the center of this ghetto gifted by segregation, by decades of racist housing policies. Blood is the voice of an angel leaving the body. So what are the two boys in this hallway doing? Evicting angels that keep us ruined in these bodies, forever longing for a flight they refuse to give. Those winged bodies thrown from heaven. I watch the boys fight. Most will call the light-skinned kid pretty and imagine his life is good despite the crack vows. And maybe it's true, but pretty won't save anyone here. Where currency is blood, where pretty has failed everyone, even Sherubin, out to leave us to this world. I say, like, you write a book, and then you read poems or pages. For instance, in my memoir, 
I take out a line every single time I read it. So I've read from the book at this point. Um, it's kind of arrogant to say it. I won't, I won't say it. Because uh, it's either arrogant or sad, right? Because I've read from the book hundreds of times, which means I either haven't written another book since then, or, or people really like that book. I don't know. But I change one line every single time. And, um, and since I'm being honest today for some reason, I will mention this line in this poem that I hate because writers always stand before you and they read their poems and they read their work as if it's perfect. And maybe you don't get insight to the torture that's going on sometimes as they read something they wish they had changed. So I'll just um, mention this one line that I wish I had changed because every time I say it, it doesn't have any musicality to it. Um, in the center of this ghetto gifted by segregation and decades of racist housing policies. And I feel bad because like in, in Boston, where I think this is a reality of life, I wish that that line would have been better because it would have had a stronger impact. But every time I read it, it falls flat on my ears and I'm reminded of one of the challenges of being a writer is when you're trying to combine sound with sentence and you see when, it, when you distract from that. Now, I don't know if anybody else heard that wrong, but I heard it wrong when I've read it and I was gonna pretend like it wasn't wrong and then let you guys think that you were the problem. But, <laughs> I said, I'm not, I'm not going to do that today. Um, I'll read a few more poems. and I'm going to read a few new poems, and then I'm going to go back to this book. And the one thing I'll say about new poems, I, I said I would talk about process a little bit. And, um, and I think writers lie about process all the time. George Sanders, though, has an interesting piece in The Guardian on, on the process of writers. And he essentially says that, um, that the reason why writing is a fiction is it's almost like, he doesn't say this, actually, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing, right? He said the reason why writing is, 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 is a challenge to explain this because it's like being a used car salesman, right? So you explain, or a car salesman, you explain the process, right? But you know it's all improvisation. So you pretend like you know what you're gonna say when somebody comes into the showroom, but in fact, you have no clue what they're gonna say. And people who are talented are able to take clues off of what the reader does. Now, I mean off of what the, the buyer does. Now, a writer doesn't do that, right? A writer takes clues off of their own mind. So I want to present this as if I know what's going on in advance. But the truth is, I have no clue of what I'm going to say from one moment to the next. And um, George Sanders sort of describes the process, I think, really well when he says that writers consistently ask questions and they try to get from one word to the next. But if they told you where they were going to end up, they would be absolutely lying. I'll combine that with a piece from Anne Sexton, a friend of not a friend of mine, but somebody I know named um, Araya Matthews. I think, I'm so bad at names. But she won the Yale Younger Poets Prize last year, and she was talking about Anne Sexton and Anne Sexton's relationship to her work. And one thing she said that I found profound was that, um, she said Anne Sexton had a, a, like a troublesome relationship with the truth in her life, but her work was about sort of excavating that and being totally honest in her work. And, um, and I think, I don't know if I'm, I'm a liar necessarily in life. I lie a lot, but, um, it's just because I think it's funny, but um, don't quote me, and I hope this is not being recorded. But, um, but what I find about the poems is that the poems are me trying to be vigorously honest. And so I read a few new poems, and these poems come from, from one, my work as a public defender and realizing what the gap was and my understanding of what was going on. And one of the gaps in this book, and the reason why I'm breaking it up the way I did is because one of the gaps in Bastards of the Reagan era is that women are missing. And any conversation about incarceration in America has to include women. I knew that when I wrote the book, but I wasn't as cognizant of it as I am now. I work in the public defender's office. I just finished law school. And I essentially work as a public defender. Um, and I represent clients. And women are, they are really the, if, if, if trauma and tragedy can be represented by a group of people, they are represented by women. And it's easy to forget that when you think about the fact that it's mostly men getting incarcerated, but, um, but it is represented by women. And so in this book, they don't come off well. I mean, I could name the three or four times women get mentioned, but I won't because it makes me look worse. Um, but with these poems, the new poems, I'm trying to rectify that. So I'll read a few of these, and then I'll read um, a love poem, which I think is really hard to write a love poem. So I'm just going to read that to show you why I think it's difficult. The Lord might have given him wings. There was something wrong with him, our poor thing shouldering this inevitable. America's hell and everything after this hour's confession. The officers upon him is blue, their shields and silences and walls drown the living. 
If prison is where black men go to become Lazarus or to become Jonas, this kid must already have wings. And his mother is the one they don't give a name. Not in that book of Job and the hardships that he carries. Because they will bury him here. And what of his victims? Their skin as dark as the night. No one calls him kid. The arms he slides in a sweater for protection against the cold, slender enough to fit in the fist of a large man is what I mean. His, <coughs> excuse me, his hands large enough to grip the black of the pistol to squeeze the quiver of a trigger. The holy have left, we know. And the kid, his halo a mess of hurt, the daffodils of poverty and the ones who abandon all of them, fathers in democracy, friends, hope, all of them except his mother who was there to witness this history as cataclysm of the guns he pulled and the dirt shrouded dead teenagers he left in his wake. When they name mass incarceration, he will be amongst the number, but the victim's mother, her black invisible against the subtext of her son's coffin, will be outside of advocacy. The kid has folded his wings into his body, and though he needs flight now, there are only years to satisfy his need for escape. Shorn now, and the corridors before him are as long as the Atlantic, each cell a wave threatening to coffle him. No one believes that he would make such a beautiful corpse. And then I'll read like two more new ones. For every bill revoked, for every bond paid. I won't ever tell you, I would say the one subtext to this one is like, when you represent, so it's weird, you could get tried as an adult, right? I was tried as an adult, so the backdrop to all of my writing really um, is that when I was 16, I carjacked somebody, and I was December 7th, 1996, and I was arrested on December 8th, 1996, and, um, and I pled guilty and I was sentenced to nine years in prison. And I became a writer in prison partly because I thought that you had to be something, you had to be somebody, and so I just decided to be a writer. And, um, and anyway, a lot of my work comes out of that experience, but a lot of my work comes out of an obsession with incarceration because it plagues you and it follows you. It's two jobs I didn't get here in Boston because I had a felony conviction, right? And, and I was driven to go to law school in part because of those experiences and my writing has always been around that. And so, the thing is, I was tried as an adult, but in, where I work now, even if you're tried as an adult, your, your parent still stands up beside you. So it's this weird dance where I'm representing this kid that's facing a prison term, and his mother has to stand up with him. Because even though he's been tried as an adult, everybody in the room knows he's not an adult. So his mom has to stand up to sort of protect his rights as his parent. So this poem kind of grow, it came out of one of those experiences. For every, for every bill revoked, for every bond paid, I won't ever tell you how it ended, and his mother won't either. But she stood beside me, and there were things that neither of us could know. And now, all is lost. Lost is all in the ruins of what happened after. Y que de eso. Algunos dirían en este mundo los vivos están en comunión con los muertos, pero no es cierto, no puede ser. But the kid, and we should call him kid, call him a fucking child, his face smooth and lacking history of razor. Without memory of a beard or mustache, he walked into the courtroom and let's just call it a cauldron. And let's admit that the tight naps on his head made him blacker than whatever pistol he held or whatever casket awaited. The prosecutor's bald head was black or brown, but when has brown not been akin to black hair? To abyss and does it matter, black lives. If all the prosecutor knew of black boys was that they kill. The child beside his mother and his mother beside me and I am not his father, more akin to a habitual mourner returning to where the state once tried to turn my soul in a shrapnel. Searching for evidence that there are angels born, it seems, in the shadows of a moon's eclipse. And that those angels bless children with wings who stand on the brink of life and disaster. And it's all possible. Because one day or night or morning, this woman and a man, the boy does not call daddy, fucked. And what would have been called passion anywhere else? 
anywhere else would have been called love. They did it, afraid and excited the way I am when a woman who calls me her man holds me. The courtroom holds it all. The memory of the two of them doing it in the air and the burdens of it. And at some point, the judge spoke and the kid kept saying, I did it. I mean, I did it. I mean, Jesus. And everyone in the courtroom shuddered. The boy's mother said, F your justice. I won't let you toss my son into that ocean. And her nails painted a red so dark against her skin were crimson. And we were all too tired to be beautiful. All right, um, one more new poem. Um, this is like, I don't know if it's a love poem, but Murals of the Heart. Tonight is not for my woman who would touch me before we speak. Not when the weight of the accumulation of our yesterdays hang like dusk before us. Each memory, another haunting thing. Not when buried somewhere behind us is all that the past that we will not let die. History, our prophecy, and albatross. The myth we measure tomorrow against. Every story worth telling has a thousand beginnings. Let me tell you this one. There was this one night on a road trip. She, my wife, was not there, already rehearsing my absence, practicing a dance of raising children alone. Distance, our disaster. And so if I say the trouble began when the car stalled, I would be lying. But the car did stall. Every light inside flashed as if the emergency was something breaking inside of she and I and not just the empty tank. Everyone wants a chance to be a hero. And so when I climbed out the truck's front seat, already I had measured the distance from the truck to the gas station, a thousand yards. I once lifted my woman and carried her on my back from where we stood to the bed that I would turn into what remains when lies become shrapnel. Have you ever seen a man push his body against a thing as if love alone would move it? That night, there were three of us riding. My woman was not there. Two of us climbed out, rolled up sleeves, began pushing, muscles strained against the darkness, the heft of the truck lurching at best. When a scrawny kid joined, his body lost in his coat, we thought ourselves blessed. A tampon run, he said, explaining why he was there on this street so late at night, his girlfriend on the side of the road and my woman 500 miles away as if to say part of love is pretending to be a hero for strangers. The truck barely moved, the way love sometimes barely moved when weighed down by memories. Before long, there were four of us pushing the thousand yards, still a thousand yards, and then we stopped, which is to say we realized the thing you want can break you. We all knew that in times our legs would shake, that our bodies would betray us and admit that the heart, though not useless, lacks the thing needed for some miracles. And yet against this truth, I keep praying my woman, who is no more mine than any woman can belong to a man, but is her own constellation of music and desire, as is anyone, will forgive history knowing a thousand angels stand beside, exhausted, too, though certain the heft of their wings will bring a gale fist enough to lift this hurt that we refuse to name. <clears throat> All right, so, um, so I'm going to switch back and read a few of the uh, poems from Bastards, and then I'll see if you guys want to have a conversation. Um, actually, I'm gonna, so I'm going to read from a long poem now, and then I'll I'll break it up and read like two more short poems. Derek Walcott just passed and um, and so the long poem was influenced in two ways by Walcott. One, it was influenced by Schooner Flight. And then two, it was influenced by like um, this idea that you wanna do something. So like Walcott wrote Schooner Flight and then he wrote Amaros. And, um, and I was like, okay, I can't write Amaros, but I wanna write a long poem. And I was like, okay, maybe I could do something that's like Schooner Flight. And, um, and so this is like me trying to do a schooner flight. And one of the things I did in the poem, it's just like an inside joke to myself, right? Because um, my first poetry workshop was in Boston. I shouldn't even tell this story. 
It's being recorded too, so I won't name anybody's name. Now I'm gonna name her name, so one day she might watch this. But my first poetry workshop was in Boston. And um, I signed up to do a workshop for, with Cornelius Eady. And he got prostate cancer. And so Marie Howe, great poet, great teacher, she had took over. And we didn't know until we got there. So Cornelius Eady, black poet, beloved. I'm thinking it was going to be a workshop that was pretty diverse. I get there. There's 12 people in the workshop. It's 11 women and me. I, and it's not like 11 young women. It's 11 like mature women who are all like smarter than me, everything, right? So, um, and, I'm, and it's two black people in the workshop, and I'm the only black guy in the workshop, obviously. And the first day, Marie was like, all right, you had to read your poem before it got workshop. So I'm reading my poem. Mind you, I just got out of prison about six, seven months ago, and I got this fellowship to go to this workshop. I'd never been out of Maryland before. I was really excited. You know, I got some money from somebody to buy an airplane ticket. It was great. Start reading this poem. I get six lines in, and, um, and, and Marie says, stop. I can't understand anything that you're saying. And I thought, how embarrassing is this? She just cut me off four lines into the poem and told me I wasn't speaking English. And um, so I was really sad. Then they critiqued the poem, and that made it worse, because the poem had some huge problems that I won't talk about right now. But, but she was one of the people who encouraged me to write. And, and then this poem came out of my attempt to try to do something well that I didn't do well then. So I'll read a few sections of this, and then um, I'll open it up for questions, and I have a couple more poems I'm going to read. Bastards of the Reagan era. Oh, one question. I'm going to read the titles. Each poem has a, each, each, it's nine sections in a poem. The title all refers to something. I do this everywhere I go. It's mostly to show that I know something that you don't know. But let me see if you guys know where the title comes from. Where the sections come from. Countdown to Armageddon, Bring the Noise, Don't Believe the Hype, Night of the Living Base Heads, To the Edge of Panic, Court Can We Get a Witness, Louder Than a Bomb, Security of the First World, Prophets of Rage. I just knew somebody was going to know the answer. No, nah, we can't do that. We can't look at the black people in the room and be like, I know one of them know it. <laughs> that was a joke. Yeah, I was supposed to laugh. <laughs> All right, it's, it's from Public Enemy. Um, so one of the things I did in a poem, though, intentionally was try to, I was playing on the idea of what it meant to come from a different place and have a different dialect and also not be able to be well understood. And what would it mean to put all of that in one poem? And so in this poem, you have, like, obviously, obviously I, I lifted lines from Derek Walcott. I lifted lines from Tupac. I lifted lines from Nas, I lifted lines from random people that I heard in the street, and I all put it in blank verse. And my argument was sort of saying that somebody might read it, and it's an argument for how language is, if not universal, is able to actually be understood in ways that we don't give ourselves credit for. All right, so I'll read, I'll read a couple sections. Countdown to Armageddon. The farm, this collection of dying men is home for just another night. And now October's rust, Snow piles upon the dead, snow flattens the scarlet leaves of maple trees, and crickets rule the black of night with song. Or if you're like me, you call it the noise that wakes you from what troubles sleep. The God and his flashlight against steel bars, his voice as low and tired as mine. Authority a gavel drop gave him makes me listen, and I strip before this man who knows me by a number, and I'm lost in shouts. And when a chain link belt and buckle wrap my waist, these nails begin to scrape the skin off my palms. My eyes still sleep, the cuffs, the bass that I pretend don't put on my flesh bite and peanut from three cages down. He stared transfixed like some mad bullfrog into this sally port so opaque. I almost say shook ones, afraid of sleep, but think his beard enough to let the dogs of his anger loose on the world after these nights in a cell become nothing but more nights in a cell. Outside, the hawk reminds my bones of blocks that street jacking me in these cuffs. How want for things had me on corners, running wild with Bama's name, Ray Ray and Quan, Dave, all of us like dogs in them streets. We were afraid is what I'm saying. 
all cliche and desire, all ignorant of what madness did birth the Swan Roads, Lancasters, and Oxford Norths that damn near ruined me. I stand and stare, body trapped in this back country that bleeds men like leeches. Body of stone is kicked from cell to God forsaken cell, each van ahead aside, somewhere a light will flash and wake a man before he understands his world has gone mad. Every bus a ride another mile away from whatever circle of streets he claimed he owned. I have braved for want of wild beasts, steel cages, called my name on bunks and rafters. I fought grown men near double my age for a rep. And now this guard, he yanks against my, he yanks against the chain so hard I buck, then buckle a man against the leash. May God have mercy on all sleeping things. This doctor fails to hide my trembling hands and all the cracked crowns with closed eyes and what passes for dreaming here. I'm boxed in. Been here so long, I sweat the funk of cells. My mother wouldn't understand. Not these half steps I take toward my bus escort to hell. I graduated high school numb, already caged with a dead man rattling about my head. And get how these back roads will take this body and yes, bury it where I'm nobody. Another man under barbed wire, count time, shakedowns, fist fights, shotguns, knives. And when we walk into the cold air, I'm on a corner with darkness compassing my days. All the currency I ever had was time, redundant gesture that it is, a waste that want for more, a waste we half dozen, half shuffling, scuffed and nicked on another schooner bound for some Sing Sing, for some Angola, for some Attica. They say Armageddon been in effect. But let me tell you how this business began. All right, and then I'll, um, I'll read the last section of this poem, and then I'll, I'll see if you got, and I'll see if we have a conversation, and I'll come back and read at least the last poem of the book, which is kind of long. Nine, Prophets of Rage. This dance we do, it borders on insane. We all have names we let bravado mask. Think Cassius Clay becoming Ali. Blame. This debt we paid a human gal on shame. That's why Raymond became Ray Ray, why Charles became Big Slim, then Chucky, poor chop, black, not Charles, nah, never Charles, always in search of room, escape. A way to run and claim the blocks that buried us, launched us on this, a flight from freedom. But I digress. We were all running down demons with our chest out, fist squeezed the hammers, and I was like them. I'm willing to admit one thing. On some days, I just needed my father. All right, thank you. So she asked about the line that I mentioned, and I had a line of the poem that I said that just didn't sound right for me, and it sounded forced. And she said that it sounded that way to her as well, but she thought that the reason was because it was the basis for the rest of the poem. And in fact, it made you hear it in a different way and allowed you to think about how it influenced the rest of the poem. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's one way to understand it, and, and I would agree with that, and I guess, you know, it's in the book, but one of the, one of the things I try to recognize is that, like, the poem is actually never finished for me as a writer, and so I could make up reasons why something worked, but the reason why I flagged it is because I never go for something that is not musical. I mean, I think that I could make you hear something in a way that's significant because of the music in it. I think I could make you hear something in a way that's significant. Like, I got a line that says, I have braved... I have brave steel cages. For the want of wild beasts, I have brave steel cages. And I, and I think that, that that line right there stands out, but it stands out for a couple of reasons. It stands out because it's this juxtaposition of um, we have cages because we don't have enough beasts that we consider wild enough to treat this way. And so I think that there's ways in which, as a writer, I try to make things jump. And for me, that just doesn't, it just doesn't work the way I want it to. I think it just... It just fails on so many levels because if somebody just stated that, I would probably say to him, I don't think that that's true. And so in a poem, I don't want to have anything in a poem that like I wouldn't believe in conversation. And it reminds me of, I just finished reading The Road and I'm, I'm still trying to figure out what I think about it. I'm still trying to figure out how much I enjoy the book, but I know that I basically read it in three hours. I stayed up most of last night reading it and then I finished it before here. And um, 
And there's all kinds of reasons to like a book, right? You could say the book is revelatory. You could say that it tells you something about the world that you hadn't known. One of the criticisms I get, and I, I struggle with, is like my book is dark. When I got the proofs back, I was reading it, and I, was, I had to read it straight through, and I like stopped to get a drink. It's like it's a lot of dead bodies in this book. Because the thing is, you don't recognize the accumulation of bodies in a book like this as you write these poems over the span of three to four years. You just don't see it. But then when you sit down and you read it all at once, you think, damn, like this is an overwhelming experience to, to just like consume all of this at one time. And so it was an argument of why is this relevant? And I found myself asking that same question about on the road where I was, I was really excited about the fact that the only two good people left on the planet were black. I thought that was an amazing decision on his part. That's like a joke, because <laughs> they are not black. And he makes sure you know that when he gets naked to swim, his body is as pure and white as snow. But um, that aside, like the book challenged me, like why do I keep reading page after page when it is unrelenting in the darkness? And I think one of the reasons, and somebody said this, is one of the reasons is that you know, the world just doesn't exist in blacks and whites and, and it's shades of gray and it's hope that's invested in everything. In that particular line, I, I think I'm missing the hope that's invested in the honesty of that line. That line is just trying to be, it's just trying to be argumentative when, when I think a poem or work of art tends to have to do more than just like lay out some kind of argument, right? So. So. Before I, I don't get barred, I'm not a public defender. I'm, I'm like on a cusp, right? And I, and I, I work as a public defender, I represent clients, um, but I just took the bar like two weeks ago. And um, so, but I don't, you know, it's weird though, man. I mean, honestly, like I don't like people who don't pay, shit, can I say this? People do things that I don't like. And then they come and they need representation. And you realize that the reason why you represent them is not because, it's not about how you feel about X thing occurring, right? It's because it's, it's, it's like a duty. And then one of the things I find with every case is even if it's, like I have a case now which, um, <laughs> this is gonna get me in all kinds of trouble. <laughs> First of all, this is one of the challenges of being a public defender, right? Public defenders don't talk about their cases. But public defenders and prosecutors are the only people who actually know what happens in the courtroom. They're the only people. And, and in fact, like I had one situation where this case is over, it worked out well. Like for instance, and this is my hope. So I met this kid, kid was amazing, right? And um, I was arguing that, you know, he should get bonded out. It was a robbery case. I said he should get bonded out. I said, look, he, he it, if this would have happened three months ago, he'd be 17, he would be a juvenile, right? So the prosecutor was like, no, there's a gun involved, I don't think that that should happen. And I said, well, let me get some ammunition. So I went to talk to his teachers, and the teachers, like every single teacher said the kid was amazing and brilliant, and they gave me quotes that people just, you, I worked in schools. You could ask me to talk about some of my students, and I couldn't make up those kind of quotes, right? So I knew that this was sincere. So I was, I was really like into this kid's success. And then two things happened. One. Um, but, but then it was this legal part of it. It was like, well, I want you to do X amount of time in lockup so that you could get time served, so that that's on the table. If we can't get a better disposition, at least we want time served, because I don't want you to go home on bond and then, you know. Now, I had been rumbling for this kid. I had been going to see people. I had been talking to his teachers. I had visited the school. I have been arguing with the prosecutor every week. And the kid mom was like, I want a bail reduction. I want a bond reduction. Like, I want my son home. And I was like, I don't know if that's the best strategy right now. We should do this, this thing, and then do that next. And she was like, what? And I saw her in the hallway, and she was talking to somebody. She was like, what the f make him think that he can make a decision? And she was just snapping. And I was looking at her, and I thought, damn, I have never seen that much pain on somebody's face. And, and, it's, and I'm the problem, right? I'm like, I am absolutely the problem. And so I went to her, but I, I like, was like, look, because I didn't want her to attack me in the hallway. And I was like, I'm going to go talk to him, man. If you want me to do this, then I'm going to do it. And I went to talk to him. He said, yeah, I definitely want it done. Now, argued for the um, bond reduction. And I did my thing, too, actually. Like, afterwards, she came up to me. She was like, I honestly didn't know if you were competent. <laughs> I was like, Damn. I lost. I lost the hearing, too, right? She said, so then all of this happened, right? Lose the hearing, but 
end of the day, it works out perfectly, right? I mean, like in a sense of we got the best disposition we could get. His folks paid for his bond. We got him a, a plea that was like time served. I think that it should have been even better than that. But, but in terms of what we were arguing for, it was the best. But what that taught me is two things. Like I wanted this kid, like I wanted this kid to go to college next week. I wanted this kid to be invested in his possibilities in a way that that he hadn't been up until that point. I wanted him to realize the potential that the people said he saw. And he was like, dude, you my lawyer. Like, you, like I get it, but you my lawyer. And I, I know you've been to prison, but fuck that. Like, you just my lawyer, dude. And unless you could pay rent, and unless you, so, so it was this a whole other host of problems. But then the other thing that, that was profound was that the reason why the mother was beefing is because nobody sees what a defense attorney does, right? except the prosecutor. Uh, in a system where it's everything is being plea bargained, all of the negotiations that I was having, all of the conversations I was having with people, the things that I was writing, like his family had no way of seeing this and having access to it. So how do you maintain hope in a situation like that? I think for me, it's just to say that, that one, I always find a reason to fight for somebody. Um, two, I recognize that the odds are stacked up against them in ways that we don't often admit. Uh, like prison is hard, man. Like a day in jail is hard, and I think some of my some of my coworkers don't even have a full understanding of of like what that means. And then three, none of my clients have gone to jail yet. I'm likely to quit soon as somebody I represent goes to jail. I'm likely to just like be like, I right, fuck it, I'm done. And and I can see the courtroom saying what just happened, and I'm gonna be like, no, I can't like accept that this is the course of affairs that should be okay. So so I have an answer, and then I have another answer when I actually have to get confronted with somebody I represent, like actually going to prison and me actually standing beside them and actually having to explain to them why, like you're going to prison and I'm not sure if you can survive. I don't know how I'm gonna deal with that piece. The reality is, um, so I mean, I'm just a lawyer which is not to say like just a lawyer, but to say that right now my primary job is to represent people who are facing, like who have criminal charges against them. I also, I'm, I'm doing a parole packet for a close friend of mine who's never had a parole packet done and he's been locked up for over 20 years. And, um, and so, you know, part of it is just recognizing that the work is, is, is actually endless. You know, you just try to contribute in a way that you can. I have like written op-eds and I've been on panels and I've been in discussions around solitary confinement to help in solitary confinement, particularly for people who are juveniles. But, but to actually say, let me spearhead this movement to get X thing accomplished is, is actually another job. And one of the things I've learned really is to accept that, is to accept that it really is another job. And sometimes, you know, if, if some, we, we, we downplay how difficult it is to dismantle a system like this. And I mean, in fact, like I said, there's only um, prosecutors and public defenders, really, and judges who recognize really how insane the system is and how it works. And I mean, it's hard even to work within a system and try to get some outcomes that seem rational, not even that seem just, but actually that, that literally seem rational, you know. That was such a cliche, right? It's like, he said he needed to be somebody. I'm gonna start telling people that. You could change your life, you just gotta know you need to be somebody. It's like, what the f does that mean in real life? Yeah. Um, I would say two things, right? First, I, I, I had a, I mean, I, I tell, I make a joke about it, but I, I like skipped 12th grade and went to prison. You know, before I got sentenced, I had my high school diploma because I had enough credits as an 11th grader to graduate from high school in Virginia. And, and, and so what that means is that I was, in least some ways, like prepared to educate myself in prison going in. And I was prepared to give myself some kind of balance. And I was already a reader, right? So those two things were working for me. And then I decided to be a writer just on a whim. I don't, I don't really know why. It wasn't, I never thought about being a writer before that I was gonna be an engineer. But the thing that happened was I was in a hole and, um, and I got this book called, um, for, it was called Black Poets by Dudley Randall. And that was the first time that I really read black poetry. And so I got that book early enough in my sentence where it could kind of change, because I was 17, 18, I was in solitary confinement. And I get this book, and within this book, it's a poet named Etheridge Knight, who had did six and a half years in prison. And the, one of the poems I read by him was called For Freckle Face Gerald. And that poem was about a 16-year-old being raped in prison. 
And so now I'm like 16, 17 reading this poem. And mind you, like I had thought that my cohort, the, the group of young men that I went to prison with, that we were the first people to be abandoned by this, like that, abandoned in this way by their country. And then I read this poem by somebody who wrote in the 60s about a 16 year old going to prison and being raped. And I had to step back from the sort of self-centered, narcissistic idea of who I was and how I fit into the grand scheme of things, right? And in stepping back, I had to ask myself, well, what does this mean for me? And what it meant for me as a writer, and I'll come to you next, what it meant for me as a writer is that, like, yo, this hit me. I want to do what he did. And the fact that he had went to prison and did a prison sentence and was in a book that I'm holding, this means that it's possible for me. And so I just kind of committed to writing, and I wrote. The best way to explain it, it was, a, it was an exhibit. It was a, it's an exhibit going around the country, actually, of like a solitary confinement cell. And um, I went to the library, because I was like, let me see what this fake cell looked like. And it was in the library, too. And I thought, you're going to do a solitary confinement cell in a library. This is rich. Like, this is very American. So, so I went there, and a woman said, um, well, you got to give me your keys and your cell phone. I said, I'm good. I think I'm going to take my stuff in there with me. And she said, well, to get the full experience, you know, I mean, if you were in prison, they would make you take your shoes off. And I thought, you know, they put me in places like this before, and they, I'm going to take my cell phone this time. I'm good. And so I went in there, and I uh, took some pictures. No, I didn't take pictures. I thought that would be too degrading. But I studied for the, um, I was studying for the bar exam at the time. So I, I did, so I spent 10 minutes studying, so I wasn't wasting time completely. And I spent a little bit of time writing, and then I came out. And um, when I came out, it was another woman that was about to go in. And she was like, yeah, you know, I was in Alcatraz once, and I was supposed to go in, but I mean, it was scary, so I didn't. And she was taking all the jewelry off like she was going through the airport. And you know, and we hate the, the thing at the airport, but we all do it. Even if it's begrudging, we do it, right? Because it's like, I'm about to get on an airplane at the end of this. And so I watched her take this stuff off, and I thought, oh, she really has no idea what this means. Because she knows that it's light at the end of this tunnel when she goes into this cell. And that made me realize that I don't know if it's a way to describe or explain what solitary confinement is. Um, one, because it's like not one or two or even 50 things. And the best I could do is one, point you to some resources and argue that it's, I think, a way to like, watch documentaries and read books that discuss it. And then two, I'll add my three cents on. But I think my three cents are generally dangerous because I was fine in the hole um, unless I was harmed in ways that I don't perceive of right now, right? But, my, but I would say watch the Khalif Brada um, documentary. I would say it's a, it's a documentary on Red Onion State Prison. And I was at Red Onion State Prison in the hole at Red Onion State Prison. So if you watch that documentary, like the cells that's there, those were the actual cells that I was at. And that gives you a sense of it. But, um, but from what I think it is, it's, um, it's like everybody has a tipping point. So some people could do I've, I've always in, it's in an um, article in GQ that I thought was really good called Buried Alive. And, um, and I like Buried Alive because Nate Penn, the writer, he used a lot of, um, he interviewed over 70 people who were in solitary confinement. And instead of just using their quotes to make his arguments, he kind of wrote his piece and then had sections with them. And they were kind of having their own texture to the conversation that he wasn't trying to explain. He was allowing to just sit there. And I thought that was a really good piece. But the, my two cents I would just add is that um, you just don't know if or when you'll be broken. Uh, so just imagine being in a place where you have, where you're essentially powerless, but also you don't know when or if you'll be broken. Um, yeah, and it's dark, and it's, you know, it's all kinds of things. I don't know. It's just like trying to explain it is, is, is probably like trying to explain a black hole, um, which is to say it would take me 25 minutes to explain it, and I wouldn't do it well enough, and then I would feel like I did a disservice um, in arguing that, like, Warriors could capture it. So I had an argument with this, kid, with this guy. So, I, so on the solitary confinement point, it goes to both of these points. This guy, I went to a prison called Osborne. It's probably my best, well, I've had some great experiences in prison post-incarceration, but I go into this prison and talk. This kid stands up and he says, you know, I did two and a half years in a hole, and, um, and I got a hard time talking to people, you know. I know you talk about, I know. Okay. I know, I know, I know, it, it relates. So he's like, I have a hard time talking to people. 
And he was like, and I'm having a hard time talking to you right now. And part of his point was saying that the whole was changed him and that the whole was different from general population even in the same way that like being free is different from being incarcerated. I was like, well, part of it is to recognize that even though you had those differences, it's not as if you aren't in the world. So when you were in a hole, you were still in prison. And you just admitted that you could talk to people that's in prison, but you're saying you're having a hard time talking to me, but we talking. One of the, and then one of the other guys asked me, well, he said, well, I had the same issue, but it's like, I wonder how I'll deal with the world when I go home, because I, I like to be alone. And I was like, you know, I, I know a lot of people that like to be alone. This shit is not new, and it's not like specific to prison. Like, you could be alone, that's okay. And I was telling him, for me, like, I resist this notion of, of, of like, re-entering society. Because I think when we argue that people who have been in prison are reintegrating in a society, we are doubling down on the notion that they were somewhere else and something else before. And that makes it easier for us to stigmatize them. So I'm not saying that you were doing it, but I'm saying that. Uh, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, essentially, in general, because you said, you know, cynical, you got rejected from some jobs, and just that experience and how you had that resiliency to keep going without... Yeah, I, but I'm, I'm saying, I think, like, everybody gets rejected from jobs. I took it in stride. You know what I mean? That's the thing. Like, why, like of course, I recognize, I, I recognize that it was part of the fact that I had been to prison. But, I mean, other people get discriminated against for very real reasons. And so I just, I just wasn't willing to think about the fact that I've been to prison as an impediment to my existence as a citizen, as if that was different or distinct from the impediments that you face because you're a woman in a sexist society, right? So, so I guess I just, I rumbled with it. And I don't know if it was resiliency as much as it was, yeah, I mean, I come from a family, I'm the first generation college student. And I come from a family, like, you know, it was a study out about Boston and black wealth in Boston. And it says like the, the, the per capita wealth of black folks in the United States generally is like $1,000 and in Boston, it's like 27 cent, right? And that's the reality. So, so I don't know if the hardships that I face are any different from the hardships that people generally face dealing with the legacy of slavery, of racism, of sexism, of homophobia in the country. And I just, I just, I give pause to the notion that I should even think about it or consider it in that way. Because soon as I do, I actually think I, I fan the flame for this notion that one of the reasons why it's difficult for you is because you haven't acclimated yourself. It's like, what, what do you mean I didn't acclimate myself? The same things I did to survive in prison are the things I did to survive in Yale. So how is it that I didn't acclimate myself? And, and both places had versions of monsters that I had to avoid. No, ask that. Prison didn't have any monsters. <laughs> so, it is, but it's that, I mean, that's, you know, and it's, and it's, it's and I mean, I, and I do think that, that that goes against common logic because I think the way that we argue for um, protection is by saying that this other place was so adverse and different that people then need things. But I like the argument that says the way that we argue for better treatment is to say people deserve better treatment. And, and maybe there is no basis for the discrimination. And I've only been denied jobs from progressive organizations. Like I've never been denied jobs from from people who disagree with me politically about anything, right? So that's the bigger point, too. Um, I'm going to read the last poem in the book. I'll say the, the last thing I'll say, and then I'll read this poem, is that one of the interesting things about writing poetry from memoir is that, like, memoir is supposed to be true. I mean, it, mine is true, actually. But still, memoir is supposed to be true, so you have less freedom. Um, the difference in a poem is that you have all of this freedom to be all of these different people, but then you got to carry that. She said, what, what do I think my legacy will be for, for black people in America or for human beings in general? Not, I, did, I went to prison when I was 16. People who go to prison when they're 16 don't think about building a legacy. Um, and, I, and I actually don't know if I, if I really seriously thought about what it, meant, what it means to build a legacy. Um, but I think, I'm 36, I think... Um, the legacy I hope to leave for my sons is maybe a more realistic, a, a question that I can answer without seeming like as narcissistic as I might be in other instances, is um, I like my sons to think, uh, I would like my sons to believe that I spent my life trying to impress upon them the importance of one, leaving the world better than, than it was when you came but of two of, 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 um, 
of doing something, right? And for me, it's education and it's law, but of doing something with the, with the, with the skills that I have, with the intelligence that I have, with the um, blessings that I've been given to make the lives of others better. And frankly, that's just not sexy enough to be a legacy for the whole world. You know, I go to prison, and no, it's something serious. Like, I go to prisons, and it's like 50 people in a prison. I was telling these guys, I was like, look, somebody kept me safe in prison. It was somebody who, you know, might have thought they could have robbed me or something who chose not to do it. And ain't, nobody's thinking about that person as having a legacy, but that the thing they did had a profound influence on, like, the rest of my life, and I likely don't know about it. The person that slid that book under my cell, the black poets. So, you know, nobody's going to talk about their life in the context of, like, what legacy that you have, although they might be in prison now bragging, like, yo, you know that was me who slid that book. But people are like, nah, that wasn't you, you know? So, so I mean, I, I, I think it's challenging. I, I, I coach my, my, my five-year-old's basketball team, and I think that means something, right? Because I, all of this started with a book club. I started a book club for five-year-olds to 11-year-olds, and then 12-year-olds to 18-year-olds, and two months later, I was on the front page of the Washington Post. And a month after that, I had an editor. And three months after that, um, I had, a month after that, I had an agent. And three months after that, I had two publishing companies willing to give me money to write a book about my life. And so, you know, when we talk about legacies and we talk about the things we do that we find important, I personally think it's what you do for the community that you're a part of. But I, I honestly think most of us will die without being having the opportunity to do something larger than that. So I want to accept the significance of that, less, less I, I set a standard that's both inappropriate and inaccessible. Um, but with that question, I'll read this poem for my sons because I, don't, because I like them. And, I, and, and this book is, is like a prologue. And for me, the prologue is the hope in the book. And the rest of the book is dark. It's not that it's devoid of hope, but the rest of the book is dark. But for me, in the same way that the sons are like the light of my life, I think, um, this book, the, the, these two poems are, I think, the light that, that makes everything else make sense. Because in some ways, my life was entrenched in everything that comes after. But even though that was true, I still got to my sons. So for me, that's the possibility. Um, Elephants in the Fall for Micaiah Miles. One. Makai Michael Zamir Betts. November's flame in that year of hard sunsets. Winter's plagiancy and days when my insomnia courted cognac. All our thoughts were beginnings, and you became the roundness that grew to a moon above your mother's hips. We waited without a name for your wonder, and three days after your birth, twice named you for the uncle you'll never meet. The name's questions, Micah, who resembles God, Michael, who reminds us of who has gone too soon. And we pronounced Micah as we wanted, Makai, because like the kid from Clockers, we scraped fists and cuffs for the dreams of you. And now when on most days your body is all blur and bustle, our song is how right we got it. When a light from that moon spilled out of your mother's belly, I tell you, you were smiling then, as if you knew you were the first song that found me worthy. Two, Miles Delonious Betts, named after the trumpet, after the sound that comes from all the hurt and want that leads a man to turn his back to the world. We named you after Monk, too, because sometimes you have to stack legends in a single body already big enough for the sound in them. And we imagined that you gave us a different tune a way to bang keys into each other until our lives fill with unexpected music. I hear you call me daddy in this land where my father's name is sometimes another word for grave, and I almost pause. It's the song that wants to unravel me. More crow than swan, I've always been so much caged and caged in, and all that changes when we square M. This old riff on a shotgun marriage calls us back. Your mother's hand and mine and a shotgun is what we aim at the world that threatens. And I scoop you in my arms and you are, and you are calling us again. Thank you. When people know that people are coming to their country seeking asylum because they're fleeing war 
they are very open and, and, and want to help.